Brethren in Christ, love day to Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. And I want to wish everyone a very happy octave of the Immaculate Conception in which we celebrate uh, wonderful Marian miracles, including yesterday we had Our Lady of Loretto, the miracle of the moving of the House of Nazareth. And today, this is premiering on the vigil of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Empress of the Americas. As uh, viewers mm -hmm. of Munich Catholic know, we have a great devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and we're very happy to welcome Joseph and Monique Gonzalez, who are authors of a very new book. Very excited to speak with both of you. Thank you so much for coming on the program today. Thank you for having us. Thank it's you. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so so uh, the Gonzalez's, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez, are authors of this new book, Guadalupe and the Flower Word World Prophecy, How God Prepared the Americas for Conversion Before Our Lady Appeared. So this is published by Sophia Press. It, it, I believe it just came out this year, right? Is that, this is... No, November 21st. Oh, I, our presentation of Our Lady. Excellent. Very, very good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, so you can link, click the link below to order the book. Uh, certainly a fantastic Christmas gift. And I love, I love finding out new amazing things about Our Lady of Guadalupe and really all of the uh, Marian elements that are in these Americas. And there, I was just learning um, in a, a couple months ago about even in Brazil, they have a different, a, a totally different Marian miracle going on in Brazil too, Brazilian Christendom. Uh, so it's really quite amazing how Our Lady has always been involved. Uh, we had, uh, obviously, viewers should know that Christopher Lump Columbus came to the Americas on Santa Maria de Maculaca Concepcion, the, the ship, at, named of the Immaculate Conception, on Our Lady of the Pillar, the Marian feast day. And then, of course, we have our lead of Guadalupe. So we're going to talk all about that in just a few minutes. Just a reminder to join our guild community, meaningofcatholic.com slash register. You can get uh, more content from us, free books and all that good stuff. We just released uh, a new book that is out, uh, When the Gates of Hell Prevail, What Catholics Do in Dark Times. And make sure to check out this new book from the Gonzaleses. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about the backstory? How how was Our Lady involved in this this book? This is your very first book as you work together uh, with music, mm -hmm. but this is your mm -hmm. first book together. Tell us about that. Well, in the early 1990s, I'm a composer and uh, I was inspired. I was actually just driving down the Interstate 5 from LA heading into the Central California Valley. And I heard some music playing in my head and I uh, I thought, it was it was interesting because I, I it was a I heard the Kyrie liaison, but I heard it with Aztec percussion and rhythms, and I thought I re, I thought it was a Mexican composer that maybe I'd heard it somewhere, and then I realized no, uh, this is being composed in my head as I was driving along. Of course, I got so excited I pushed down the accelerator. Uh, I. I was speeding down and uh, hit 96 miles per hour. And of course the California highway patrol pulled me over. I got a ticket while he was writing up the ticket. I like a good composer. I always have music paper around. I, I tried to write down what I was hearing in my head. And then uh, that spurred this whole idea of setting uh, Aztec song poetry because it had Aztec percussion. I thought, okay, it's Latin mass. Let me try to combine the two. So I, I got into this thing called Aztec poetry and uh, I was living in downtown LA at the time. I was checking out all these different uh, reference books. And, and one of the main books uh, that had just been published actually in 1985 was a book called Songs of the Aztecs by John Beerhorst. Um, there's, there's about 180 known Aztec song poems. Uh, 90 of them are in this one uh, collection, Songs of the Aztecs, or it's called the Cantares Mexicanos. Now what happened is that I, I looked at the first poem of that in that collection, and there's a song there called Origin of the Songs, or in Nahuatl, the language that was spoken at the time, it's called Huica Pecayot. And it's about a singer who is looking for flowers. Uh, he wants to go into this paradisal a realm in Nahuatl is called in uh, excuse me, in Xochitlalpan, in Tonacatlalpan, which roughly translates into the flower of paradise. He wants to go there so we can gather flowers in his tilma 
so that he can present them to the lords and princes. So if you're familiar with the Guadalupe narrative, you can kind of see the similarities right away. Uh, I saw this poem. I was shocked. I looked. I turned to the back of the book to see the commentary, mm -hmm. and um, John Birho said, "Well, obviously, this song poem is the is the um, source material for a fabricated Guadalupe narrative. In other words, Guadalupe is a hoax, and uh, this Made is up. the way the Spanish duped the uh, indigenous into converting." So I was very puzzled. Uh, this was, like I said, in the early 1990s. There wasn't a lot of information out at that time. You were because, starting your career. Uh, yeah, I was starting my career in music. Um, of course, Juan Diego was, beat, uh, was um, canonized. canonized in 2002. And the research for that canonization really started in 1996. So there was a flurry of information that came out. Um, but, but you didn't know about but it. But I didn't time. know. And it, 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 I didn't know about it at that time. But anyway, um, it hurt my faith because, you know, uh, I'm Mexican-American. My grandma's name is Guadalupe. I went to Our Lady of Guadalupe Elementary School. You know, she's everywhere. She's in every bakery and, you know, auto body shop and, you know, everything in, in, yes. in, in the community that I was living. So anyway, uh, that's what started this whole adventure. And it turned, uh, everything changed in, in 2009 when I met my wife. But that's, that's kind of, that's what, that's that's what spurred this whole thing. Wonderful. So, Monique, can you tell us more about what happens next? You come into the picture. He's already got this on his mind what? after even a decade. Uh, tell yeah. us about your side of the story. So my story is I'm, I'm a convert for all intents and purposes. And three years prior to this, I had had a I, I call it a conversion with Guadalupe because I'd had a problem with Mary prior to that point. I had an experience um, 2006. And then three years later, I met Joseph and it kind of gave me more context as to why that happened. Because when I met him, he hired me pretty fast. Um, we started working um, on a movie, but I had a little bit more time because he was in the co composing mode. So Carnegie Hall had asked to uh, perform the entirety of the Misa Azteca. That's the a, piece that, that's the name of the piece that eventually that, turned out that came from this. That came from that inspiration in the 1990s. And they wanted to do the whole thing. And he wanted to swap out some of the movements or the, or the songs that are, that are part of it. So he hands me the poetry. He says, can you help me find a couple of new song poems? So I could set to music. And of course I open it up, go right to the first one. Got to start somewhere. The origin of the songs. I read it and go, whoa, this sounds like the Guadalupe story that I've been like obsessed with the last three years. Um, and he, he comes in the, into the studio. I still remember this. I said, Joseph, what is this? This sounds just like the, the Guadalupe story. He's like, well, go to the back of the book because the guy says it's the basis for you know, a fabricated Guadalupe and hoax. And so we started talking and saying, no, nah, there's got to be more to it. I think maybe because of the direction I was coming from, I, I just kind of figured that, you know, let's let's dig it out and God's going to show us the way, so to speak. And so that started this 14 year, what we call our wonderful obsession of research that finally gave birth to this book. Oh, that's wonderful. So, so why don't we start with this sort of apologetic, because obviously we have this other author who's claiming that this is sort of proof that Guadalupe itself is a hoax. Um, mm -hmm. How how do we see that as Catholics instead of a hoax? Well, starting, um, well, we, we did several years of research and we, and we had an open mind. I mean, we actually were starting off from the premise that this was a hoax. And knowing that it wouldn't hurt our faith because it's private relation, we don't have to believe in it. So we kind of detached ourselves a little bit right. in order to do this. So. Right. And after looking at so much information and going to original source historical documents, uh, reading kind of we had to read past the critics. Right. Mm -hmm. And finally, after a while, we said, you know, there's there's so much here that's going on. It seems impossible that this could have been a, a hoax mm -hmm. overall. We had to resolve so many different doubts that were on mm -hmm. on our mind. And we, we had to do that first. And it broke open with. Zeke Steers and Jane right, Hill. exactly. We 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 met a collaborator, a wonderful <clears throat> professor of this time period. He has his PhD in early colonial Spanish literature, mm -hmm. Dr. Ezekiel Steer, and he led us to a lot of information and databases and papers that we didn't have access um, to. So we started developing this since we didn't believe it was a hoax that Guadalupe was real. 
it started to, this idea started in plant, coming into our mind that perhaps the Aztec song poems, because they're so similar, are not they're not a hoax, but actually they could be preparation mm -hmm. to the Guadalupe story. And after, once we go into the, the description of the narrative, you, we're gonna, we, we actually see it that the earlier song poems look like prophecy. They actually look like a part one that goes into the Guadalupe narrative, which yeah. everybody knows it acts as a part two. So, um, it, it, you know, we'll go into the narrative and we'll show you how those, how they, how they connect together. But we, we went to Mesoamerican conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a big one at the Getty Museum here in LA. And here. I was talking to one of the uh, presenters, one of the fellows. I mean, these are experts in this time period. And we were having lunch and I said, you know, what would you think if the origin of the songs, the Cuica Pecayot, this ancient uh, Aztec song poem, actually is a part one into the Guadalupe story? Mm -hmm. And he was shocked. Strong goes, reaction. You know, I could see that. I could see how the story goes into the next. He goes, you got to write a paper on this. You have to do this. And that, that was really kind of the first time it hit me that, wow, you know, this we guy knows. On. We might be on to something. something. So <clears throat> this is part of what made us commit to this hypothesis that we had well that's it's fascinating and um i i have two kind of general questions uh and then we want to get into the content of your book um one what is the state of scholarship in nahuatl and these these pre-spanish languages and two uh is a lot of the scholarship sort of anti-catholic and sort of promoting that narrative and scholarship where it's kind of like oh the spanish came and destroyed this civilization and this all this sort of thing um how, how what was it like interacting with all that scholarship oh it, it's pretty much unanimous uh guadalupe is a hoax that's what they believe yeah. Yeah. um it's almost like a cottage industry there's books on this, there's papers, there's documentaries. There's actually a documentary that's going to come out in a few months yeah. in Spanish, uh, mm -hmm. saying that Guadalupe is an Aztec pagan goddess. It's called Tonantzin. Yeah, I, I <clears throat> rarely do we see uh, scholarship that is mm -hmm. not anti Guadalupe. And if you go up to and you speak to the scholars, the general consensus is, are you really bringing that up as an actual possibility? You can't be serious. You're a rational human being, right? And so you'll get these funny looks. And <laughs> that's usually when we have to segue into like other topics because they, they won't continue talking to you if you stay on the Guadalupe topic. So yeah, it's like it's like uh, Luis Medina has told me that the the Mexican government has been just so violently anti-Catholic for 150 plus years. But the people of Mexico yes. have been so stalwart with Catholic. So it's been just always mm -hmm. this the intelligentsia it's and the crazy. elites are very anti-Catholic. But the Mexican people mm -hmm. have Guadalupe in their hearts. So I, one of the mm -hmm. things that struck me uh, looking at your book um, was that. What you do here, here's the, this is the table of contents here for your book, mm -hmm. is that you go all the way back to 2500 BC. This is way mm -hmm. back before the Aztec. You got the Olmec, the Maya, and the Teochichuan. Uh, so tell us about before the, now, are the Aztec, po are they going, these, these, um, this poetry songs that you're, you're starting with, are they going way back to the Olmecs or is that, is that more of with the Aztec later on? Tell us about the early days. Okay, the way it works is you have these, all these different civilizations. And, and how we got to there was because uh, when Joseph was explaining about that ancient song poem, there was one particular phrase that, that encapsulates the flower world paradise. in And that particular phrase is um, indicative of an ancient indigenous belief system of a solar floral paradisal realm that one can go to after the, one dies and also consider the place of, of man's origins in these different civilizations. And it was through that particular study of the flower world paradise that we found out from all of these different scholars that they're tracing it back to the Olmec civilization. So that early BC times is when they think it originated and started developing. And then as it goes through the Maya and the Teotihuacan, it's just growing and developing, growing and developing um, and, and into like not into flower world studies and then Nawa philosophy, which we get into in chapter four, that there's this entire 
how do you say, back context to where it comes from that's millennia old. Did you want to? Right. Essentially what's happening is that in the world of anthropology, archaeology, and linguistics, it's it's a new study called Flower World. Flower World. And a lot of scholars pinpoint it to the middle formative Olmec period, which is around 1500 BC. And essentially what this is, is um, during the during the high uh, cultivation, oh. agricultural cultivation of maize, of corn. of corn that we know it today, that this idea of a floral paradise, that, that uh, corn, which can give you sustenance in a field that is filled with pollinators such as butterflies and hummingbirds and flowers and flowers and we're talking about like the <laughs> Yucatan Peninsula here so many people say that this concept might have started there and and, um, and then spread because all the cultivation of maize spread throughout the Americas so um, that's kind of the initial mm -hmm. premise of this but the thing is is that it it turned into a maize cult and there's a lot of uh, concepts what we two of them in particular is the flower world paradise or an afterlife that you go to. The second one is a transcendental connection between beauty mm -hmm. and sustenance, beauty and ultimate beauty in this divine realm and, and, truth. and truth, this connection between the earthly realm and the heavenly realm, which is depicted as a, as a North, South, East and West, or as the four cardinal directions of the universe. The way they did it was superimposing a four petal flower over this with the middle point going up to ultimate reality or the flower world paradise. So this is the, the connection that was made. So this these transcendental ideas develop over time. And when we get to the Nahua period, which includes the Aztecs or otherwise known as the Mexica, that gets developed and, and gets explored philosophically. In, philosophically in poems and primarily in kind of mythic narratives. That, that's that's amazing because you know you consider the the context of the gospel even even the Hebrew the Hebrew understandings of the afterlife and the Greek and Romans is very much you go to Sheol like Odysseus goes to the af the, the underworld everybody just goes to the underworld and they're just down there and it's pretty bland <laughs> and and not very nice Shall afterlife. We? No one, no one looks forward to that. Is looking forward to some better afterlife. Even in the Hebrew uh, revelation, there's not really hope for this sort of paradise as much as is revealed later on. Um, so, can you tell us more about the the content of this Noah uh, philosophy that uh, develops this transcendental um, afterlife view? Right. So we right now we have the flower world paradise, and we have the flowers as a dominant symbol or connection between heaven and earth. When we get into the Nawa period, which is about 1400 B, uh, AD, uh, in these flower song poems, you see that they're wanting to make this connection to ultimate beauty in this flower world paradise. And many these concepts that you find uh, in ar archeological ruins, such as depictions of four petaled flowers, or pyramids that are oriented in an east-west uh, fashion because this east to, uh, excuse me, west to east. East to west. Excuse me, east to west <laughs> is the path of the sun. This is the way that you that the nobles mm -hmm. and the warriors can go to the flower world paradise. It's well, this turns into a narrative. And in particular, the origin of the songs really kind of sums up their belief. It's highly symbolic, highly metaphorical, but Monique is going to give that narrative right now. So that narrative, as Joseph alluded to a, a little uh, snap snapshot of what it looked like, but how it starts out is you have a singer who's looking for holy, precious, sweet, aromatic flowers. So he asks the hummingbirds and he asks these different birds, a couple of them that will show up later, mm -hmm. butterflies, et cetera, where can he find them? And a hummingbird steps forward to lead him into this flower world paradise where they can be obtained. But what happens, unfortunately, is he only seemingly gathers the flowers in his tilma. Right, to he, carry, wants to he wants to gather these flowers gather them. in his tilma so he can present them to the lords and princes. So what we find out is you see like a whole uh, verse where he's 
quote unquote, picking the flowers, putting them in his temple and carrying them down the mountain. But you find out that he didn't actually get to go there. And you also find out why he didn't go get to go there. He says, it's because how could one who was worthless and afflicted and who sins on earth obtain those precious flowers and be able to go to this flower world paradise? And luckily within a, a line or two, he explains why he couldn't. He says that, and, and it's inferred by what he says, only the God of far and near can make one worthy of the flowers of paradise. So very quickly we understand that, and he's lamenting, you hear him crying out, I wish I could gain those intoxicating sweet flowers. And so it ends on a lament, but also a note of hope that someday somebody could be made worthy by the God of far and near of those flowers. Wow. So, uh, as, so yeah, it, it's essentially, it, it's a paradise lost it's type a paradise scenario. Lost story. It's, it's a half quest. He he starts the quest, but he isn't able to obtain the end point of actually obtaining the flowers. Right. So, paradise lost story is a common thing that you find in pagan cultures. It's a way in which pagan cultures could explain the fallen world in which they live. And the thing about it is that it's also a hero story. Mm -hmm. It has all the hallmarks of you know the Joseph Campbell monomyth which is where you have a sink, you have a, a, a protagonist who wants something, who has to go through trials in order to mm -hmm. get it. Mm -hmm. And either the, the hero is successful or he's not. If, if the hero is unsuccessful, as in this case, he's a tragic hero. But the funny thing about that is that the, a tragic hero always cries out for a redeeming hero, somebody who is eventually going to, re, who is achieve, going to that achieve that quest. And of course, that's why we're that's one of the points that we're saying why the earlier song poem is a part one, because the singer doesn't find the flowers, but in part two, uh, Saint Juan Diego finds the flowers, and there's so tons of implications of the completion of that uh that trajectory, mm -hmm. and, and we can talk about mm -hmm. it more. And okay. one of the great well, things is sorry. Yeah. You're oh, saying? go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to dovetail with, you know, we just talked about the Quika P. What happens in the beginning of the Quica Nicomopoa? Um, Nicomopoa which is, is, which is the, the Guadalupe. Account of Guadalupe yeah. It's the account of Guadalupe in the indigenous Nahuatl language. In the very beginning, Juan Diego, is he in, he's coming up on the hill of Tepeyac as he's traveling down to Mexico City to participate in the sacraments. And he's swept into a paradisal realm of singing flowers and radiating light and precious stones. And so when he goes upon it, the first thing he says is, am I worthy of what I hear? Which is kind of hearkening to that ancient song poem. And the second thing he says is, could I be in the place my ancient ancestors spoke of? In Shoshit Lalpan and Tonakat Lalpan, he uses the exact same phrases in the ancient song poem. So you start seeing he's connecting himself and the whole, uh, all of the apparitions of Our Lady of Guadalupe with that ancient song poem. Wow. Let, well, let's get in. I want to get into those details, which are so, there's so many amazing details about Guadalupe and that you're seeing this parallel. But before we get into that, let me just, I want to ask about how did the flower world cultus, which seems to be very much this part one of Guadalupe, how did that interact with the Aztec, cultus of the sun and the child sacrifice or human sacrifice and whatnot were, were they in conflict or was was there sort of um any meshing with that pre-christian uh cultus right the way that we like to explain this is that we have flower world concepts that we've been discussing but of course what we really know the the people of mesoamerica for is polytheism pantheism and human sacrifice but funny, it's very interesting because it seems as if a lot of these flower world con uh, concepts actually undergird a lot of ideas about human sacrifice that, that, we, that we all know about. And let me give you a quick example. In the early, in the mid 1400s, uh, around 1450 or so, that was really the spike. That was the beginning of the spike in human sacrifices, massive human mass and human sacrifices, the, the it, it it really amped up around 1487 with the building of the Templo Mayor, uh, the main temple of Huichilipochtli, the war god. And of course, from 1487, it, it really amped up until Cortes showed up in 1519. But 
the name of those wars, which were specifically meant for sacrificial victims, what were called the flower wars. And the reason why they were called flower wars was because of this underlying idea, a concept of flower war world, where a warrior would want to go to war to spill his blood because if he were to die, he would turn into a butterfly or hummingbird and he would go to the flower world paradise. He'd be made worthy. He would be made worthy in that way, of course. And then, of course, even for the sacrificial victim, because his blood would have been sp uh, spilled in these flower wars, he would have also gone to the flower world paradise. So it was kind of like a win-win situation as far as they saw it. We make the case that flower, these flower world concepts were actually kind of twisted and perverted for elite ends um, and, and we can go into that because I think we can prove it. But the thing is, is that um, what what we know about, you know, about 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 the Aztecs and the brutality, we try to make the case that actually flower world concepts kind of were were parallel or motivating or motivating or undergirded a lot of the stuff that we already know about, you know, bloody Mesoamerica. Can I jump off of that real quick? Sure. What's interesting also along with that, even though the party line was that you could be made worthy of the flower world paradise by sacrificing your life and your and your body, it, at the same time, like in 1490, and Joseph will probably talk, go in more detail, there was a poets conference where a whole bunch of the, the wise men slash kings of the period gathered together and questioned the party line. They're actively saying, is it true we have to do this? in order to obtain the flower world. And that's when you start seeing sort of a more open dialogue amongst themselves, uh, pondering the reality of truth, the reality of death and of life. And maybe you could speak a little bit more to that. Well, yeah, it was, they, they, had a, they, were, they were pondering the meaning of flowers. They were pondering the meaning of the flower world paradise. And it was very, very deep and philosophical. And a lot of people don't know that the, um, you know, the, the Nahua people, there were many different groups, not just the Aztecs, but that they were very, very philosophical and, and pondered these ideas. And it happened just a few decades before Guadalupe showed up. Well, so the, the generation before Guadalupe, before Cortez, they're already they're, they're it sounds like they're recognizing that there is some sort of propaganda at work here with the so the Aztec elites and their empire utilizing using and abusing this existing ancient uh epic poem that's already in existence in these these philosophical uh beliefs so how does how does guadalupe step in and sort of give the better answer to this this whole mystery of the flower world tell us more about the details and these parallels with uh saint juan diego well one of them is this um for example, well, we already mentioned one that at the beginning of the story, Juan Diego wanders into this paradisal realm that's, that is just like this, the description that is in the flower song poems. And he even names it by name, as we've already said, in Xochitlalpan, in Tonacatlalpan, the flower world paradise. And he goes in as a commoner, what they call a masajual, but masajual actually has a deeper meaning. It actually means a, a, a person who is not worthy of going to the flower world paradise. So he walks in there. The first thing he says is, am I worthy of what I hear? Of course, questioning why should why should he as a commoner be able to go into this flower world paradise? But the difference here in the, and the way that we're trying to explain it is that he he's, goes into there as a baptized Christian. So that's kind of the first kind of crack right in these in these uh, ancient kind of preconceptions right and as we said before guadalupe excuse me in the earlier song poem it says that only the god of far and near can make one worthy to enter the flower world paradise well when guadalupe identifies herself she she does it in five different ways but what the third way that she uh, identifies she says i am the mother of the god of far and near so if you connect the dots, <laughs> here we have the earlier one where it says, you know, you can only, only the God of far and near can make you worthy. Well, if you connect the second part, Guadalupe says, I am the mother of the God of far and near, the one who can make you worthy for the flower of paradise. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. that's another example. But, you know, as we was talking about our book, we say that in our book that there are four primary ways 
the transcendentals because of the flowers meaning ultimate truth which is what juan diego symbolically and metaphorically gathers at the end of the guadalupe narrative he actually finds a truth that evaded the earlier singer so that's pillar number one transcendentals to pillar number two life after mm -hmm. death in the flower world paradise three a one supreme god and four all together this means worthiness that you can be made worthy through baptism because mm -hmm. Juan Diego was a baptized Christian to be made worthy for the flower world paradise. Wow. Now, how does now, one of the miracles of Guadalupe is that St. Juan Diego brings to um, the bishop the roses of Spain. And that's the key miracle that he he wasn't expecting those roses that came from uh another back across the atlantic how do how do the span how does the spanish element fit into this as well well the way we explain it is that um that there were many there were many different things that were going on at the same time it was so important to convince the bishop uh that 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 a miracle had happened and the fact that the roses occurred the miracle of the tilma he had to be convinced and you know we, we say that, you know, it wasn't all butterflies and roses and, and really a perfect thing that happened after the, the Guadalupe event actually is very turbulent. And Guadalupe really appeared in the historical document through these controversies that would happen. And we don't have to go into everything. But Bishop, Bishop Zumarraga needed to, to be convinced in order to allow Juan Diego was just a few miles away to be in Tepeyac at the Hermitage for allow him to be there and for the story to spread. So that's just one of many reasons. So we say that there was, there was a message to the Spaniards, but there was another message to the Nahuatl. It was a double message. There was a double message. In fact, there's actually a theory about this. It's called double mistaken identity. And the definition of that is you can have two cultures side by side an event can occur mm -hmm. and the two cultures will interpret the event in two completely different ways. Yet at the same time, mm -hmm. the one culture will not even care how the other culture it won't occur to them. It won't even occur to them how the other culture is interpreting the same event, but they have their own way of looking at it. And we were going to go into this double mistaken identity uh, concept. It was, it was just too many, we too took much it out information. Of the book, we took but, it out of the book. But it is a key thing. It's a key thing. The miracle of the roses meant two different things to two different people. people. Yeah, well, I, I think one of the one of those miraculous things is bringing together these two different ethnicities and bringing them really to marry each other and 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 birth this whole race of race of mestizos that it is all of uh, Mexicans and that's one of the most beautiful miracles. But um, now. Mike, uh, here's a question: Is now what was the flower world um, epic, epic poetry? Was this sort of just orally known by all the sort of the common people? And that was that. Uh, how did how then did the uh, Guadalupe story? How did that get spread? Uh, it, you know, we we talk about these massive conversions. Guadalupe is is called sort of this evangelist, the greatest evangelist mm -hmm. of the of the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Was the story spread sort of mainly just oral, an oral story, and then people were able to connect it, or was the image, uh, people come to the image a lot, or was, or the written? You mentioned the written, um, uh, the Noah uh, account, but then the question is, how many people were even reading at that time? Were many, many readers, or mm -hmm. was that written language brought in by the Spanish? How was it spread? How was the message spread? Okay, it was clear there was already established tradition that had, had been around for centuries, is essentially anything of importance, a historical uh, exploit of a king or a war or anything, would have been turned into a song poem. Including their beliefs. Including, their, especially their well, beliefs. Well, yeah, that's one part. The other thing is that their philosophical ideas would have been turned specifically into flower song poems. Now, this is not an uncommon thing. When you look at Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey, many uh, historians, historians speculate that those stories could have been ex existed in oral tradition, perhaps for centuries before they were written down. And one of the biggest key thing, uh, indicators of this because they were written in verse, it makes it easier to memorize. Well, a similar, apply that to what was going on here. These songs were memorized. There were music schools 
all across Mesoamerica from village to village. And Mandatory. The, and the purpose of that was to memorize, was to memorize these historical events and including the philosophy. So that had already been established. And the way it would have been done, by the way, is usually you had two mm -hmm. singers in the, in the middle accompanied by a log drum standing and horizontal, a wewet and a teponasli, that were their names. And you would actually have dancers around them. Um, there's eyewitnesses that this, this had occurred. And there's also an eyewitness that this had happened to the Guadalupe narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one account and we, oh. and we put it in our book that that's mm -hmm. what, that, that this, the, the Guadalupe narrative itself would turn into a flower song. It would have gone through the same process of going from village to village to village. And it would have, it would have like, uh, it would have been copied and duplicated like a computer, computer meme. meme. It would have just <laughs> spread to thousands. Yeah. And so that, that is, that is our theory. Uh, and, and I think we're pretty well backed up that that's how it would have spread. Well, that, that's mm -hmm. great. That's this. This is something that I wrote about in my first book, which is oral culture, and this is something that people it's have very hard mm -hmm. time understanding for us because we have a literary culture. But back then, when people could not read, that doesn't mean that they were stupider. Basically, they were actually smarter in other ways, like memorizing long, long poetry that we could never hope to memorize things like that. But people, that was just a normal education, as you just you just mentioned. So uh, in those days, people with oral culture, they could hear a poem or hear something read out that would take an hour to read, and then they would memorize it immediately. It was just one-time thing. People were memorizing these things. Uh, and that, that's that's pretty amazing. And that, that makes sense that this would just happen. Uh, here's <laughs> here's another question. Um, who were the first, because there must have been, um, you know, obviously St. Juan Diego is a Nahuatl, but was there, who were the clergy who sort of figured out, who were the Spanish clergy who figured out, wow, mm. all these Nahuatl, are seeing this in their own totally indigenous context and they have a totally different view than we do as Spanish. We need to, we need to, uh, you know, continue that propagation for the gospel. How, who were the Spanish with the Franciscans? I know the Franciscans are pretty big in Mexico. Um, who figured it out and how, how was it spread by the Spanish to continue that? Well, they started studying the language within the first couple of years, but of course it took a long time for them to really uh, learn it. And in the 1550s, um, a Franciscan by the name of Bernardino de Saun made it a, a project of his, and it was actually done under obedience as well. He presented it to his superiors and they said, go ahead and do it. He spent three years gathering the song poems between 1558 and 1561. And then from that point on, he started collecting as much as he could in order to evangelize them a little bit better, be able to catechize and explain some of the Christian concepts. And he, he knew that that couldn't be done without a, a full collection of their ancestral traditions. Yeah, but I think what I'm kind of getting from your, your your question is that the that perhaps the Franciscans, yeah, they, they were the they were the first ones there. They were really kind of the primary evangelizers at that time. Uh, they didn't know about Flower World. In yeah. fact, they didn't know about any of this. In fact, they they, never made the they were very very suspicious. Uh, there's there's several quotes where they after they gathered so many of these flower song poems, they said, "We don't understand them. We don't know." to what they're referring. They're indecipherable. Uh, they're, they say they're indecipherable. Uh, they're pagan. Let's just take these flower song poems and store them in some convent. And that's what they did. And they they, they were there for hundreds of years. They were it, never meant to be published, any were, of them. It was solely for research purposes on their side. Right. So a lot of the understanding of these song poems has really only happened in the last 50, 60 years. Wow. Um, the concept of flower world really has been around for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. So this is all new scholarship. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it, it was, it was actually kind of, uh, antagonistic or, or mm -hmm. the, the friars, uh, were not into, they didn't know about flower world. Mm -hmm. They, they, they didn't like any of this stuff. Um, the only thing they did use, they did use the term Xochitl Tlalpan, which means flower world. Uh, they did use that term as a, a term for heaven. But, um, but they didn't understand but it. They didn't there's, under no, like, there's no nothing in the original writings from the Spanish showing that they understood what it meant. Right. So wow. So so the Spanish are are looking at all of these Nahuatl, all the Indians, and they're they're all coming to them for baptism, and they can't quite explain exactly why they're doing it. They understand that Guadalupe <laughs> is involved somehow. They understand that they they're now coming together, but they can't quite explain it until 
until now, at least at least what this aspect of it, at least. Wow, this is this is this is incredible. Uh, so thank you for publishing this book. We've got about five more minutes. Joseph and Monique, um, final thoughts. What are some of the most surprising or valuable things that uh, you put in this book that you want people to hear? Well, what we what we want to do is that we we want to show that there's deeper layers, uh, you know, to the Guadalupe story. Mm -hmm. You know, so much has been written about the tilma and the images that are on there, and what they they meant to the 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 Nawa people. Um, but th this other aspect that that deals with metaphysics, uh, that deals with philosophy, that deals with true myth. We haven't even talked about that. You know, Tolkien ideas. Um, that th that there's this is not a simple fairy tale like story there's mm -hmm. deeper deeper meaning and we'd like to really encourage uh, people to to you know especially devotees to get into these deeper levels of myth and how a myth can turn into a true myth as it happened uh you know it, with, with jesus christ and also with the story of guadalupe mm -hmm. so we're just trying to encourage people to use their reason along with their faith mm -hmm. to be able to discern mm -hmm. these things. Because in these times right now, as we had yes. mentioned before, where the battleground is happening in the academic world, we got to fight fire with fire. We, we, we need to be able to explain our faith. We have to be able to logically say, to come back and say, okay, mm -hmm. well, if, if Guadalupe is, a, is a, is a myth a fabrication, mm -hmm. then how do you explain flower world and, and its connection? How do you mm -hmm. explain these different things? How could 40 priests forcibly convert 9 million mm -hmm. indigenous? I mean, just mm -hmm. basic questions. A lot of these things can be torn down quickly and easily. If, if we can kind of like get our act together in a way. But yeah, give, give reason for the hope that is within us. I mean, the scripture even tells us to do that. So this is sort of our contribution to that. Right. And, ooh, excuse me, my voice is correct. Um, but the other thing is, <laughs> I'm getting excited here. But the other thing is that uh, the way in which God's providence or mm -hmm. prophecy plays into yes. this. And if you'd like, I know Monique has some things to say about that. Well, just the whole idea of, you know, God being in control of history, you know, that Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared in a time when nine, they think about nine to 10 million people left the Catholic church during the Protestant Reformation, you know, and to have that same number coming in. And it's such a time of tumultuous chaos, both on the Spanish European side, as well as on the indigenous side that she kind of breaks through and resolves all of that. We're kind of in a similar period now, we believe. So why can't we look at it like God did it then he could do it now. So that's, it gives us a point of hope to focus on as, you know, we go through all of these changes right now. Absolutely. I, I, it's such an amazing story how Guadalupe becomes this Empress of the Americas. And then she goes all the way back through the icon that's that um, is mm -hmm. is on the ship in Lepanto in 1571, which also connects yes. with uh, Guadalupe mm -hmm. Extremadura in Spain, which predated mm -hmm. this. So it's, uh, it's just amazing <laughs> how God put it all together, even at this time when, as you said, Protestant revolt, you know, people, Catholics could have looked around at that time. like, Wow, the world is ending at this point. Mm -hmm. And yet God was intimately involved in working everything out in his providence. So we can also yeah. look in, in our own day that, that God is going to work everything out. We've also got a, a modern, we've got a lady of Fatima who's working things out. There's everything. Mm -hmm. God is involved. Mm -hmm. He's in control. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thank God for that. And uh, so let's, uh, let's pray on Ave Maria to uh, end this out uh, and thank God for our lady of Guadalupe. Uh, can you all uh, pray the second half of this for me? Yes. Yes. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Empress of the Americas. Pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.